What time is it? Is it, is it time to start? Yeah. Okay, let's talk about marijuana. Uh, so hopefully everybody watched the psilocybin lecture. Um, and this kind of fits within that. Like if I'm teaching you how to make illicit drugs, might as well do the whole gamut. <laughs> Um, so let's just quickly review from the psilocybin lecture. What were the kind of like take homes from that? What, what do I, what do you think I want you to take home from that? The method for cloning multiple humans. Yeah. And we have talked about this uh, quite a bit. So this fits within the golden rice. It's a little bit different than the spider silk because here, you're here they had to clone a whole pathway, so there were four genes. I think if I remember correctly, it's something like psi A, and then there's some other ones, whatever they are, B, C, D. I know that there's four genes, and are they eukaryotic or prokaryotic genes? Eukaryotic. They're eukaryotic genes, so they come from a fungus. So one of the issues, so again, like just just reiterating. Um, issues or problems you face when having to do stuff like this. If your goal is to make a something like a plant or a bacteria or a microbe, whatever that makes psilocybin, you got to take these genes, you got to try to kind of figure out how to make the constructs shorter. So one thing you're going to do is you're going to strip out the introns. So to strip out the introns, you're going to use a special cloning method, which is going to be using Yep, messenger RNA, you're gonna clone from the messenger RNA. And that's gonna use reverse transcriptase. So it's kind of like a special style of cloning eukaryotic genes. And it depends, it depends on what study you read. There's a, there's a couple studies that have done this with the psilocybin pathway in different organisms. Sometimes they're cloning from the messenger RNA, other times they're just synthesizing the construct. And just like we talked about last lecture, they literally, in some of the ones that I've read, they literally do what I described, which is they have one promoter, they put the four genes, and in between the four genes, they put the T2A peptide. This is one of the most recent studies I've read where they build a construct that looks like this, they insert it, and we remember, we recall that the T2A peptide is a virus peptide that causes a ribosome to skip. So a transcript gets made that looks like this, and the ribosome makes a protein A, and as it's reading, it skips, and it makes a protein B, and as it's reading, it skips C, skips D. You make all these four things, and they come together, and they make psilocybin. So that was kind of like the, the gist of the lecture, the take home points, the th key things to remember that I might ask about on the test. I, I'm not gonna ask again like specifics about knowing the names of the genes, but the cloning strategy is what you wanna take home. You wanna know that eukaryotes, you have to face this issue, introns, exons, you might be cloning from the messenger RNA. You might be trying to figure out strategies to reduce the code by using or engineering like a eukaryotic operon kind of thing with these T2A peptides or ribosomal entry sites, um, et cetera. So that was the gist. Any questions on that? Okay. So on this theme, let's talk about marijuana. So all of these are, um, marijuana is a species, cannabis, sativa, okay? And there's different strains, just like any agricultural crop. There's different strains. One you hear as hemp. This one is typically legal. And the other you hear is marijuana. This is illegal in some spots. Um, what's the difference between these? Do you guys know? Production of THC. Yeah. They both produce THC. 
So THC is tetrahydrocannabinolic acid. And it looks something, let me draw it super quick. Something like one, two, three, four, five, that. And all the CBDs kind of look like this. What are CBDs? These are cannabinoids. They all kind of look like that. So the only difference between hemp and marijuana is marijuana produces higher concentrations of THC and hemp produces lower concentrations. And there's kind of like an arbitrary determination by whatever state you're in as to essentially like what level of THC is illegal. And they actually like test these. Oh my God, I spelled that wrong. They will actually like test these for THC levels. And you could actually, you could actually be growing a hemp product and hemp is legal in Alabama. So there are, we, we do grow hemp in Alabama. Um, and you have to, you have to be careful because sort of like almost through spontaneous mutation, you could have strains that then overproduce THC and end up like evolving more towards the marijuana type strains. So you have to be careful. Um, let's talk more about hemp as an agricultural product. So all the, when you hear like the CBDs, those are typically hemp strains. So I think in cannabis, there's a, about 300 different types of CBDs and people are getting more interested in the cannabinoids, these molecules. Some of them have uh, interesting properties, obviously make people feel better, et cetera, make people more relaxed, whatever. So most of the cannabinoid like oils are produced from hemp strains. The other product of hemp, so one product of hemp is CBDs. What are the other products of hemp, you know? Fibers. Yeah, this is one reason I'm actually really interested in them. Is there's so there's there's CBD strains. So within hemp, there's strains that are made for CBD, and there's also strains that are fiber strains. So hemp is grown for different parts of the plant. The CBDs come from typically like like um, the fruiting body, whatever the the, the buds. The fiber strains are the fibers. You're essentially like the stalk of the plant, like there's different parts of it. You can take the stalk of the plant and go through different treatments. One's called redding. There's natural redding, which is they grow the hemp. They essentially like cut it down and just like leave it outside. And natural microbes sort of degrade certain parts of the stalk. And then you can take the stalk after a certain amount of time and you can just kind of like peel it apart and it makes these fibers. So it's so you can take those fibers and then you can spin those fibers into hemp fibers. You can make clothing. I'm interested in it because I want to try to do knit stuff with it. If you don't know, I, I do, I study knit, knitting and stuff like that. So I want to do some experiments with that. The other thing that people use the fiber strains for is actually construction materials. This is kind of like, um, an area of research in, I guess, like building science and material science is you can take different parts of the plant and you can make like hempcrete, which is kind of like concrete with hemp. You can make different building materials that you could, uh, in theory, like build houses with, which might be more sustainable, might be, maybe not be, might be more better under certain situations. So there's actually like a lot of products that can be produced by hemp. And as I said, hemp is important, or it's becoming more important in Alabama. We're growing more of it. And, and then in the marijuana side, marijuana is legal now in, medically legal in like half the United States now. And I think it's only a matter of time before it's like totally legal everywhere. It's kind of the writing is on the wall. So this is, this is gonna become more important as an agricultural product, I think, in the future of Alabama. Let's see, did I miss anything? Okay, so let's talk about 
the the idea that some of these strains have more THC, some of these have less THC. So THC is just some chemical. Guess what it's made by? Guess what the enzyme's name is? So it's more simple than the psilocybin pathway. There's only one. Well, I mean, there's a longer path. There's a long pathway, but the, the it's synthesized. It can be made from just one enzyme as long as you have the precursor. So the enzyme's name is THC synthase. So THC synthase takes a precursor, precursor X, and makes THC. Okay. What do you think causes the difference between these strains? Is it prevalence of different amount of hydrogens on the THC molecules? No, the THC molecule is the same in hemp or marijuana. There's just more or less of it. Like the gene expression? Yeah, what controls the gene expression? Yeah, it's probably it's so it's probably literally just mutation genetic variation in the promoters that's controlling the differential regulation or the differential expression of THC. And it, it has some the studies have like shown it is a transcript level thing. So it's definitely like transcription of this gene is more or less in certain strains. And so you could see very easily how these strains could kind of be evolving back and forth just by tweaks in this promoter. Let's see. Okay. So obviously like this unit, this unit that we're discussing is on engineering crops or product, uh, engineering crops or plants or organisms to make some product in a recombinant way. So there are some early studies. I think the earliest one I was looking at was 2000, something like 2004. They took the THC synthase gene and they expressed it with baculovirus in SF9 cells. So baculovirus is a virus system, right, to review which works well for insect cells. SF9 cells are what type of cells? What? Nope. Those are lepidopterans, correct? Yeah, they're lepidopterans. They're butterfly cells. Call them lepidopteran cells. The Drosophila cells are the S2 cells. Why do you think they would do this? Knowing now what we've discussed in the last two lectures, why would they first try to overexpress this with baculovirus and SF9 cells? What, what would that make you think of? Why would that be? Why would that ever be your first bet? Rich, why would you? Why would anybody ever express stuff in SF9 cells? Well, because it comes from like SF9 So elaborate. Why would I express? How does that make sense? Why would I express a plant product in insect bug cells? You're on the right track. Because it's very large. No, no, not that large. I think it's like 58 kilodaltons. It's not that big. Yeah. Post yeah, like there's a there was a characterized post-translational modification. So the gene, the THC synthase, if you take it from plants, it's N-terminally glycosylated. So what's a glycosyl group? Yeah, it's like a sugar. So proteins can get modified, right? They can get sugars attached to them. If it's attached to the end terminus, it's attached to the end terminal part of the left part of the protein, the beginning of it. So it's end terminally glycosylated. So this is why they would originally try to express it in SF9 cells. So again, like this is just the review of, not necessarily the specifics of this are important, but reviewing the idea of you might choose SF9 cells if there's some special modification. Like if somebody's expressing stuff in insect cells, you should immediately think there's some kind of modification that might be important. Although later they express this in other types of cells without the glycosyl group, 
Uh, and it actually seems it apparently works somewhat better if you don't have a glycosyl group. So it's not apparently necessary. But that's what they first expressed it in. Um, at this point, they've expressed it, and I had a table here, they've expressed this in E. coli, they've expressed it in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, they've expressed it in Pythia, and this seemed to be the best one. So let's talk about kind of, again, like kind of, it's always good to think about like, why, why do this? Why not just like grow the weed? Like why would you wanna try the overexpressing it? There isn't necessarily a right or wrong answer. I'm kind of like brainstorming. I mean, growing a whole crop would require significantly more uh, resources than a culture. It could, yeah. I don't, I don't know if that's always like. So, for example, it's probably not cost effective to grow it in SF9 cells. They probably first just did that as like a proof of concept. Like you can take this gene, you can overexpress it, because SF9 cells you have to buy media. For, media is like ridiculously expensive. So I would bet it would probably be way cheaper to plant the plant than doing an SF9 cells. But you're right in a sense of the philosophy that. Um, if, if what you want from the marijuana is the THC, then it's totally reasonable to assume if you could just reconstruct that pathway in a microbe, you could probably just grow giant like vats of it, like beer brewing, and you would essentially could produce it at a cheaper cost. So the question is like cost effectiveness. But the, I would say that like, this is always something that's always like worth re-examining because at the end of the day, it might be easier to just grow the plant. And so you don't want to spend a lot of time engineering something that's sort of like pointless. I think it makes more sense for the psilocybin at this point, because mushrooms are really hard to grow. They're really, they're, you have problems with contamination. They're picky, they, uh, they're, it's, they're nitpicky. It's hard, to, it's hard to grow mushrooms. And so I think in some senses it might make more sense with the um, psilocybin stuff than it does with uh, THC. Well, it could also be similar in that to the psilocybin because THC extraction from the marijuana is like it's kind of difficult. Like if you mess it up. THC like extraction is difficult? I don't actually know. Is it? It can be. You have experience? But you're right. You're, you're right in a sense of, yeah, there is going to be, well, it depends on what you're using. Like if you're selling it and people are just smoking it, like then you don't have to extract it. But if you're doing some kind of like medical, yeah, like extraction, uh, that's definitely going to be a part of, yeah, a part of the process. So you'd have a question of like, is extraction, like, is it reducing your yield? And this would be true for any kind of like, um, what's the stuff that Shannon studies? What are they called? What the natural, what are the, na the natural oils? Is that what they call it? Essential oh, yeah. oils. This would be true for kind of like essential oils as well. Like if there's an extraction, sometimes the extraction, organic extraction might be real easy. Sometimes it might be like more difficult. It, um, it could be like the amount of time that it takes to grow cells is probably significant. That, yeah, that, that's another thing to think about is, yeah, speed. I think that relates into the cost effectiveness, but certainly, yeah, is it is it much faster to just do it with, with cells? Well, there's like a bunch of implications, you know, that could like, raising plants could be like, like cross-pollution, like thinking about water systems if you have fertilized, and like, there's a lot of stuff. They're probably growing lab. Yeah, but like, no, I'm saying like, like plants. Well, you're kind of thinking, well, I guess the biosystems engineering angle, what do they call that, uh, where they and no, I'm just thinking where they like analyze all the co environmental costs in the production oh, line. LCA. What's life that cycle, called? Life cycle assessment. Life cycle assessment. So yeah, like maybe like agriculturally growing the product, could it could be more damaging. Way. Yeah, than perhaps just growing a vat of microbes. I'm not sure. All I'm saying are all these things that would consider like you would consider why you might want to do this. Um, another reason is there's. There's 300 of these different CBD molecules, 
And we have, I guess we have pretty, a lot of experience with some of these, like a few, but some of these are more rare in the plant. And so there might be some kind of rare CBD oils or whatever molecules that have unique effects and you might not be able to get enough production of them in the plant. So then upping the production in a microbe would be a better, a better way to do it. It's probably not the case for THC, but amongst some of these, there are probably some low hanging like fruit in there of something new to discover. So these are all reasons like why you might do this. Um, Okay, so I want to point out as kind of like a flip lecture, I want to kind of point out patterns we're noticing in recombinant expression as kind of like a meta, meta things that we're observing in the spider silk, the psilocybin, and then this kind of like the THC idea. Um, generally, what's always trying to be done is ag biotech, is, 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 is it oftentimes trying to like upregulate the production of some substance. That's obvious. So in many cases of this like beta carot, so if I just quickly list the examples, the beta carotene, that was with the golden rice, the psilocybin, the mushrooms, THC in the marijuana, spider silk, yeah. spider silk <laughs> in the bacteria. So the first step of this is always you need to identify the pathway. Okay. Third step is always you're inserting it. And there's many different considerations when you're deciding like what should you insert it into? How should you insert it? Number four, this is kind of like a key point, which is all of these, it's not just about inserting the pathway. It's not just about figuring out like, oh, it's gene X. Insert gene X. Why have we learned that that doesn't always work? The cell you're transforming it into might not have the necessary resources to produce the gene. Yes. So what do you call those resources? is actually kind of like a term I'm looking for, which is like the precursors. So it's not just a matter of like, oh, I'm gonna put some THC gene in corn and like our corn's gonna be like weed. It's not like that. You, you, you can't just like pop genes in. You always have to make sure that there is an abundant um, reservoir of whatever precursor is required. So in the spider silk example, what was the precursor for to make that? That was rate limiting. So here I would put a word rate limiting. Or in chemistry, you hear the word limiting reagent. The limiting reagent is like the reagent that if there's not enough of that, production halts, it stops. And so it's not a matter of just providing the gene, it's also a matter of providing the limiting reagent. So in spider silk, what was the limiting reagent? The glycine. Yeah, the glycine, just an amino acid. It needed more glycine because the spider silk protein had lots of glycine. In psilocybin, what is the limiting precursor? Similar. Shows me who watched it. Yeah, good. Who said that? Very good. Bonus points. Tryptophan. Tryptophan goes into the psilocybin synthesis pathway. Okay, so that's the, so. Um, let's list the other ones. The THC, the rate limiting thing is something you don't need to know. It's I have it written somewhere. CBGA. 
It's some like cannabinoid acid thing, whatever. Okay, but we've also learned something else, which is that not only do you have to add the gene, you have to add the precursor. What they tried in the spider silk assay was how were they, how, they tried a few ways to give the precursor to them. What were the ways in which they were giving the precursor? Well, let's expand on this. Do we remember? It was overexpression of tRNA. It was um, overexpression of the what was it? of Gly A, which was the actual synthesis synthesizer of glycine. And they also tried something else. Did anybody catch it? What else did they try to do? What would be? These are kind of like a really complicated way to engineer something to like give it the precursor. What's the simplest way to give the organism that you're trying to culture to give it these precursors? What would be the simplest way? Like put it in the culture. Who said put it in the culture? Yeah, literally just like feed it, feed it to them. Okay, so this is a common thing is they'll literally just like add it to the media, feed it. So in the spider silk assay, if you actually read closely in parts of the experiments, they're literally like dumping glycine in the media. Okay, but it's also more complicated than that. It's not just giving it the gene and then feeding it the precursor. What's the issue of just dumping glycine in the media? What do you need in order for that to work? Yes, you need a transporter. So again, this kind of goes back to like that first lecture where I was talking about if you program a cell program some gene to do something, you gotta tell it where to go. It's not always just a matter of, oh, I'm gonna put like glycine in the soil, or I'm gonna put glycine in the media. You have, there has to be a transporter in the membrane of the cells of that creature to actually bring that nutrient in. And if the transporter isn't being upregulated, it might also not work. So there's a whole bunch of like steps in this chain and oftentimes, like engineering things to express stuff is a lot more difficult than you would ever imagine when you first like decide I'm gonna do this. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay. So just for fun, um, it, is kind of, it is kind of bizarre to think about some of these, these chemical reagents that like mess with your mind. So there's this, the people, some of the people who study this are, they call themselves the ethnobotanists. This is kind of like worth talking about. What are ethnobotanists? Have you heard them? If you watch the lecture on Terrence McKenna claims he's one of these people. These are people who have like gone and studied. What are, what are, what are the people who are? Are they anthropologists? Yeah, anthropologists, that's what, that's what I'm thinking for. They're like anthropologists and what? I think it's ethnobotanists. Oh. I just spelled not, it wrong. I yeah, said that though, didn't I? I think you did, but then I just <laughs> was like. I'm, I'm really confused. bad at spelling, no, and I, I try to like. Yeah. No, I don't have a problem with. It. I just was confused at first. So yeah. No. Ethnobotanists. No, you're right. Ethnobotanists. I hope I said it like that. <laughs> They're kind of like anthropologists, so they study like ancient human, I guess, cultures, and so they go to these like ancient human cultures, like in South America or, in you could think of like regions in Australia or wherever wherever you find these sort of like more ancient cultures. And they look at the plants that they are consuming for like shamanic or medicinal purposes. And there's actually been kind of like a decent amount of work now where they're identifying these chemicals. So if you think of like uh, DMT, is in the ayahuasca, I'm not gonna to try to spell it. It's like a mixture of certain plants. The psilocybin, 
the THC. What's bizarre is that humans have like specific receptors in your brain that these bind to. And in some cases, it doesn't seem like it's, um, like it might be a specific evolved interaction. It's kind of like what they're hypothesizing. So psilocybin binds to serotonin receptors. I don't know too much about biological psychology, but I think serotonin is like the relaxation, feel good kind of stuff. DMT, I don't know what receptor it's binding. THC binds to, we actually have uh, CB, it's called the CB1. We actually have cannabinoid receptors. in our brain, like in the neurons, in the synapses. So it's kind of bizarre that these weird like plant substances bind to specific receptors in our brain. What do you think that suggests? I'm curious. Like, in terms of evolution, that would suggest that there's like some benefit to us having a receptor. Yes. And so people were doing it a bunch too. Yes, and so some of these things, like some of these things are ancient, right? Like that was kind of my point in the psilocybin lecture is psilocybin usage is like at minimum documented 10,000 years old in cave paintings, like where people are drawing the mushrooms. And it, their point was these mushrooms grow in uh, the feces of cows. So as long as people were culturing cows, they were probably eating the psilocybin mushrooms at the same time. And they even go back and they think, they think like whatever humans were probably hunting, like when they were tracking them, they'd probably find psilocybin mushrooms. So the fact that these, these chemicals have like specific receptors in our brain, like this interaction is probably pretty ancient, like probably even before humans. Like this is probably, probably animals are eating these things and getting some kind of benefit. And that's kind of the, that's kind of like the argument of the ethnobotanist. This is like, there's like this, they say there's like, this, there's this uh, evolutionary relationship between these. I don't know whether it's true or not, um, but their pitch is, so I, okay, what do you think would be the evolutionary advantage? What would be like, if, what would be our best hypothesis? What would be the advantage of like, consuming these psychotropic substances? For humans or for the plants? For either animals or humans. The plants, they say they make them as kind of, they, they claim like the THC stuff that I think is associated with like defense. So it's probably something with like insects eating them, maybe, who knows. But what would be the advantage to, what, could there be an advantage to humans taking these? Yeah, so psilocybin definitely affect, it affects like visual, visual, visual acuity. I've used this word twice today. Visual acuity. Um, like if you're, if you're taking psilocybin muscles or mushrooms, you can, like it, your vision is sharper. But it might be, like it could be that, although that's a short term benefit. What would be like a long term thing that might come out of this? Something with like culture. Yeah, and that's their point. That's their point is when you take these things, oftentimes your brain is now functioning in a little different way. And so you're making associations that you would not normally make. So they're kind of like, a, they're kind of like association gen generators where you get like new ideas. So part of like the stone tissue theory? Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Well, sort of. Uh, so you get like new ideas or like, essentially like, I guess the scientific word for these would be like memes. Like you, like and a tool, like an idea for like a new tool, that would be a meme that would replicate in the population. So if you were like a population of apes and you were taking some of these and for some reason you had like better ideas than your next ape tribe, like hopefully you all have seen 2001 Space Odyssey where they like, that one ape touches the, he touches the, the black monolith and then he gets the idea for like killing other things with bones. And then, so he's like, it's the first invention of the tool. Like if you 
had those ideas, you would in theory be at an advantage over other tribes. And that's their argument. That's their argument is some, there's some, there might be something evolutionary deep about taking these psychoactive substances, getting new ideas, and then those ideas becoming memes and like offering a selective advantage to that population. What time? Three thirty-seven. Oh my god, that went fast. Okay. Any questions? Could another positive just be mental stimulation? I don't know. So that okay. So this is a good. Let's talk about this. So other positives. When you say mental stimulation, what do you mean by that? Just deviation from the norm. And well, what do you mean? Like you're not bored anymore, or you mean like, like you're thinking of new ideas? Like, how is that different from thinking of new ideas? I mean, if, you know, you're, I feel like, well, at least when I'm bored all the time, I get pretty down and just like, being not bored all the time could just be like higher morale or. The um, thing is, the thing is, so I'm not disagreeing, but what I think you always need to connect it to is reproduction. Like, definitely like you should always be thinking of, if there's gonna be some kind of psychological advantage, it has to somehow connect to replication. Otherwise, it's not going to be selected for. Does that make sense? So like anything that you posit might be a benefit has to relate to reproduction. Now, if they're getting like, okay, so if we get weird here, if they're getting like super stimulated by like taking these things and they're reproducing more, then that could conceivably be like an actual benefit. Like they would have more children and then like there they would expand more. So it's, that's something like that is possible. But the point is, is like anything related to selective advantage in evolution has to somehow be connected to reproduction. Yeah. Social aspect. So what do you mean? Bringing people together, you know? It could, like if, yeah, perhaps like if, if like maybe they would, um, like maybe your society would have better organizational hierarchies if, if maybe they'd be more peaceful or something like that, or, or maybe they'd be more warlike, I don't know, whatever. Because the, the, the Viking berserkers were supposedly would take the hallucinogenic mushrooms right before they would like go into like berserker battle. Yeah. What were you gonna say, Lonnie? If your like, time is reproduction, reducing like the stress hormones in the body, like if, if it relaxes the person, the stress hormones are able to like decrease reproductive success, like you'll, it'll mess with your hormones. So, so they're like, <coughs> they get so stressed out, like they don't want to do it anymore. Well, like, well, like, Wait, what did he say? I don't have approval for those experiments. <laughs> um, yeah, good. Who knows? Anyway, it's fun to think about. Like, I like to, I like to sort of sidetrack in the middle of the semester on on these lectures because I think they're fun, and they're actually pertinent. Like this, the psilocybin stuff. Um, is actually like being medicinally applied now in post-traumatic stress disorder and things like that. So I think these hallucinogenic things are gonna become more popular. The weird thing about, so, so when I read Terrence McKenna's book, the really interesting thing about, I guess, drugs and society is, so if you look at psilocybin, um, if you look at like, uh, what do they call it? The, the lethal doses, the LD50, the lethal dose of things where, so the lethal, LD50 is, this is a good lesson, LD50 is the dose at which 50% of the population die from that. If you actually like rank drugs in terms of like danger, alcohol is like, it's like the worst possible drug you could possibly take. And the LD50 is like ridiculously high. So it's kind of bizarre that like alcohol is totally legal but these things are not legal, and yet you can literally eat like mountains of mushrooms and you would never die. You would never even have a single toxic effect. Um, the, other thing, the other thing that's weird is if you, put, if you put caffeine and sugar on this list, their LB50s are also like really high. So again, like it's kind of bizarre that we have these, these chemicals that our society has said like these are bad, but in terms of like our physiology, they're actually not toxic at all. We have receptors in our brain for them. So it's just bizarre to me. Um, like I think our society could do a lot of thinking about the things we think are bad uh, and rethink some of those things. So I'll end it there. <laughs>
Have a good day.